Thank you very much. Well, so can you guys see that? Yes. Cool. Um, yes. So yes. <laughs> my name is uh, Francois Dutois. I'm a PhD candidate in the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio uh, with Nicholas. And today I'll be talking about how we use LIDAR for phenotyping in tree improvement programs in BC. So first we'll just talk a little bit about tree improvement in BC. What are the current methods, um, the limitations, and then uh, kind of where airborne laser scanning or LIDAR fits in um, in that cycle and looking at a few of our case studies with coastal Douglas fir. And then chatting a little bit about the work that we're doing right now and what the future holds. So um, these programs, tree improvement programs, are designed to develop genetically improved trees to increase the economic value of the plant forest. Um, so to do that, a base population is defined, and then we select best trees um, so that we can propagate that population. And then that cycle can be repeated multiple times to maximize that, those gains. Um, so the trees are phenotyped in progeny tests and then tested in realized gains trials to confirm that these predicted gains um, are actually real and what we're, what we're predicting occurs. Um, so while this has been successful, um, these programs started in the 50s in BC, there are some limitations. It's labor intensive and expensive, and especially once crown closure has occurred, measuring those uh, large trees accurately is difficult. In addition, because we're focused on yield estimates in BC, there's only a few measurements that are taken. And so we don't really know why these trees are structurally or functionally different from each other or whether or not they are different from one another. Airborne laser scanning or LIDAR can help us address this challenge. Um, in the past, Low point densities limited us to area-based approaches, but with technological improvements, such as increased data storage, increased point density, cost decreases, we're able to now look at trees in a different way and look at those individual trees as opposed to an area. So when we're thinking about phenotyping these individual trees, um, LIDAR gives us the ability to provide proxies for traditional measurements. So if we look at the figure, we can calculate things like tree height, tree diameter, crown height. Um, but it also gives us the opportunity to derive um, other metrics. So we can calculate things like the volume of an individual tree. And ultimately, that allows us to derive metrics that can measure um, structural differences between trees in these improvement trials. Um, that leads us into our case study on coastal buckles fir. So we collected data for two different kinds of genetics trials at five different sites. And then we tested a variety of approaches. We, looked, we wanted to look at variation in crown structure between trees at the individual tree, at the branch scale, and then also um, at the area-based scale to see kind of what came out of that. So here's a map of where our study sites are. So that is um, Southeast BC. It's in the seed planning zone, by Southwestern BC. It's in the seed planning zone of the Douglas fir. Um, Robertson is kind of uh, very much in the South. Um, and this is an example here of the realized gains trial. This is a typical setup. We have multiple different spacings and we have different um, genetic levels of trees. So the wild stand trees are a control. They're, un they're an unimproved seed source where the mid gain represents a 10% gain and the top cross represents an 18% gain. And here we're defining gain as the volume gain for the tree by rotation age. We acquired two LIDAR data sets. The first was acquired using a UAV. Um, we flew about 50 meters above the ground and we got a point density of approximately 650 points per square meter with two returns per pulse. 
We then uh, got data from an airplane using a optic teleband optic sensor, giving us about 200 points per square meter with seven returns. And so here you can see that was our UAV that we used. And this is an example of the um, trial using the UAV data. We can see um, in a cross section how the two data sets are a little bit different from one another. UAV data is very dense, whereas the airborne data uh, does get attenuated as you go down into the crown a little bit, but you can very clearly distinguish individual trees. So once we've acquired our point cloud, we have to get to individual trees. Um, in general, the pre-processing processing steps are the same, regardless of what our ALS acquisition source is. Um, so that, that pre-processing is really what makes all the difference. So this is where we have to classify, clean, normalize the point cloud for detecting treetops and segmenting those trees. Um, there are challenges associated with each one of these steps. So when we're identifying noise and ground, how strict do we want to be? What are our parameters? How do we define what a treetop is? Um, all these different algorithms have parameters that vary. And for a given forest type, it's not a one, one button fits all solution. We have to go through and see what works for our forest type. And the same thing for the segmentation. Should we use a raster-based routine or a point-based routine? Um, however, once we have gone through all of these steps, uh, this is the result. We get a point cloud that is nice and clean. It's normalized, it's been segmented, and it's been clipped to the appropriate plot. And at this point, we can start um, describing and producing metrics for each tree. So in these studies, as I mentioned, we took three broad approaches. The first was to summarize the whole tree. Um, we created metrics looking at the vertical distribution of the point cloud, um, some volume-based metrics. So that's what you can see on the right. Uh, you can see how varying this alpha parameter can give us different volume uh, measurements. We also looked at using the Weibull probability density function. This was particularly nice because you can describe the whole tree simply using two parameters. And then we also looked at voxel metrics where we're building 3D uh, boxes of a certain dimension and then looking if the points, if there are points occupying the boxes or not. What we found was generally uh, trees of different genetic levels were different from each other. Um, in the example here, we have a Weibull probability density function. X-axis is the density, the y-axis is the normalized height. And we can see here the 2.3 meter top cross trees are pretty different from the wild sand trees, which are shown in red. Um, in general, we found that these trees, the top cross trees were typically taller with higher, shorter, and denser crowns, um, but that the interaction between the spacing and genetic level in these trials was important to take into account. The next approach that we took was, we wanted to zoom in a little bit and characterizing branches in the tree. We chose to look at the upper third of the crown because this is above where that crown closure and all the competition occurs. So we thought this would be the best place to look at differences in the branching. And we wanted to see if we can find length, width, angle, and the volume of these branches. But to do this, first we detected uh, clusters. We created 50 clusters in a tree and then iteratively merged those clusters to produce branches. This was based on um, work by Connie Co. Um, and then after that, we could use a uh, principal component analysis to produce surrogates for tree length and tree width. So that's just PC1 could represent the length of the branch and PC2 could represent the width. And then if we treat PC1 as a vector in 3D space, we can calculate that angle of the tree branch. We could also create some volume related metrics the same way as we did for the whole tree. So here we found that for all trees and for all metrics, uh, the top cross trees at that four meter spacing were consistently significantly different whenever genetic level or spacing was significant. And we also found, again, the interaction of spacing 
and genetic level was important and we needed to take that into account. So it's not as cut and dry maybe as we want it to be because we have this interaction. The third approach that we took, this was work done um, by Samuel. We were looking at um, three different sites and how well could we predict the ground measure gain. So from the figure we can see at all three sites and the full data set, these results were very good. Um, the model uses metrics representing leaf uh, realized gain for leaf area index and mean canopy height to predict volume. So very good results. Um, and so far, we've had a lot of success with these approaches. And so what we're looking at, at doing now is what are the applications uh, in different genetics trials? So in these progeny trials, can we apply these metrics and help improve or enhance breeding value estimation and how we think about breeding values? Um, as a reminder, we had two sites that we flew that were progeny tests. At these sites, there's 2,000 plus trees planted per site, and they were planted in 1977, so over 40 years old now. And they were used at around the age of 12. They estimated the breeding values of the parents, and these are the trees that are being used um, as the improved seed source in BC. So these trials have been periodically measured over time, and so it's a great way for us to be able to uh, compare our estimates from ALS with traditional ground measured reading value estimates. The workflow is largely the same. It's just a bigger trial. And there are some challenges in that it's very important to match each tree um, individually. So whereas with the realized gains trials, we had a group of trees that we were trying to match and it didn't really matter. We just knew the genetic material was improved. Here, each parent, it's important to know whether the, what the female parent and the male parent is. So we were very careful with how we did our matching. Um, and so there was quite a lot of manual interpretation, as you can see in the figure on the right. But that being said, there are some encouraging preliminary results. Here we can see uh, on the y-axis, estimating breeding value for height that was measured in 2010, compared with an ALS estimated breeding value for the 95th percentile that was measured in 2018. So even though there was an eight-year lag in these measurements, there's still a very, very strong correlation between the two. So this work is in progress at the moment, but we hope that we can continue finding results like this and that we can publish something soon. Um, and yeah, so finally, the outlook for integrating this remotely sensed data into tree improvement programs, I think, looks uh, extremely bright. The data is becoming more accessible. Uh, it's becoming cheaper and easier to collect the data, and the processing is becoming simpler all the time. Um, I think, you know, there's free and open forestry-specific packages that are becoming available, like LIDAR which we use a lot in our lab. And I also think it's important to note that we're at a point where we have enough experience with the different technologies that we can focus on the strength of a given technology. And so we can pick the right tool for the job and also maximize the information that we're deriving from a single acquisition. So whereas before we maybe didn't know what densities we needed for different um, trials, we're getting to a point now where we can actually see what's working really well for us. So I think moving forward, that is something that we can do as well. And so Sam and I have published a couple of papers on what we're doing at the moment, and hopefully we publish a few more before we finish our studies. Um, but with that, I would just like to say thank you. And, and none of this would have been possible without our funding partners and our co-authors. So. Nicholas, Samuel, Yusri, Al-Khasabi, and Tristan. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. That was brilliant. Um, I have a couple of questions for you, but first maybe we will have a question from uh, the attendees. You can raise your hand or uh, just 
wish I could see the raising hand. Uh, you are talking about using the proper tool uh, and using them correctly. I've seen at the end, uh, the lower part of your canopy is slightly missing. Have you thought about using terrestrial LIDAR to complete um, your structural tree? And is there any advantage of that? Or is it better to just um, look at the top of the canopy? So the one of the, I think, the advantages of the airborne laser scanning is that it's quick and you can cover a relatively large area. And so the idea for the work that we started off with was this is something that you could do regularly. You can cover quite a lot of ground. So we did these five sites in five days. Um, and so it was just one of those, that is where we're saying that speed of acquisition is important. And we think that the density that we can gain from um, our data acquisitions is dense enough. The TLS, I do agree in terms of architectural modeling is probably the way to go, but at the same time, I think the limitation there with you only you can only do a couple of plots. It takes a long time. It's kind of weighing up those benefits. And so, if we we only did five sites, but I think, and Samuel might be able to correct me. There's like twelve or fourteen progeny trials for Douglas fir. So if we want to characterize all of them, trying to find that balance, um, I've been. I think there's more and more um, stuff coming out with um, packages around finding that middle ground. So we have been looking at mobile laser scanning, which is not as um, not as dense as the TLS, but we have maybe some data fusion opportunities where you can go in and you can collect that data on the ground and then merge it with the data from above to kind of give you a more full picture of what you have. Unfortunately, we don't have that data, so. But. It will come, uh, same with uh, the progress and the improvement of uh, flying drone and their canopy as well. Um, I've read about that, it's really impressive um, what some people are uh, able to do. Dave, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um... Great presentation, Francois. Thanks. Um, lots of interesting material. I was just wondering, did you observe differences in any of your metrics between the ALS and the UAV laser scanning? I mean, they had quite different point cloud characteristics. You know, the ALS had up to seven returns, and yet the UAV LIDAR clearly had much higher density. Um, so yeah, do, do you have any comment on, you know, for example, an alpha-shaped metric, do, do those different point cloud characteristics affect those metrics? Yes, so we made a decision um, relatively early on to use each data set kind of independently of one another. Um, the UAV, Lighter that we collected was, I don't know if you know, Arco Lucier came over from Tasmania. So we used their system. Um, so it's pretty cool. Um, I do think that there are differences. And I think I'm not, so yes, I, I think there are differences. I don't know if, how important that is if you're just looking for within tree differences. So, if the alpha shapes that you're getting can clearly give you a difference between two genetic levels, whether or not that alpha shape is the same between UAV and airborne, I'm not sure if that matters as much, but I definitely think that you would have different characteristics. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, for, for a trial analysis, I think you're exactly right. It doesn't matter. You're looking for relativities between trees, I guess. We do wonder about um, longer term assessment of genetic trials. So their, their existing methods are quite manual and tedious, but um, 
at least theoretically they're, they're repeatable and they've maintained them over time. Yeah, so it's an interesting challenge. You know, we can create yeah. awesome data out of remote sensing, but as the sensors evolve, I guess we have to think about, you know, carefully about what kind of metrics we're using. Yeah, I also think, so as we, as we go back and definitely moving forward, we'll have that opportunity to do that repeated measurement and whether or not you stipulate that that data has to meet a certain standard or even that maybe we downsample to that original data set for a while, that might be a solution. Um, because I know the new DJI system, for example, it has different characteristics um, to some of the other systems that we've seen in Canada. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to solve that issue, I think that consistency is kind of the key. So how do you ensure that you have that consistency? But. Yeah, but no, it's, it's great work you're doing and um, we, we have to start somewhere, right? And um, yeah. <laughs> we build on it, yeah. Uh, I think I have a question. No, uh, thank you, uh, Francis. Uh, it's a... Uh... A uh, very good presentation, and uh, I learned a lot from your presentation. And uh, and, uh, and I'm also very happy to see the Canadian forest, uh, which is used uh, familiar for me because <laughs> I did my PhD, you know, in Canada uh, with Dr. Lika Scoops. And also, I like your background. It's a uh, it's a forest in Canada, or is that scanned yeah. by lidar? No, no, I think it's just, just a. a picture. Yeah, it's just a <laughs> default forestry photo. Oh yeah, it's a uh, yeah yeah okay. It's a uh, uh, for me. It looks like uh, kind of like a eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. Yeah, it a Almost. little bit. It looks like yeah. You see the the color of the thing, right? <laughs> a little bit. So okay. Uh, so uh, very good presentation, and uh, I just have a uh, uh, some questions. Uh, it's not about uh, lidar technology or remote sensing. Uh, it's about um, uh, forest. Uh, so uh, I, I think you did a very good research, a very good uh, um, collection uh, between remote sensing and uh, the genetic research. So uh, do you have uh, some co cooperation with uh, other uh, scientists, maybe uh, a genetic uh, researcher? So <laughs> yeah, so, so in uh, this project, we initially worked quite closely with Michael Storr, who was part of the BC Ministry of Forests, Lands and Resources. And um, the, that's kind of where that initial point of contact happened. And then Yusri El Kasabi in the faculty, he's a mm -hmm. genetic, and so he's been providing some of that, um, I, yeah, some of that information there and one of his postdocs as well has been helping. So now that we're moving more into looking at those breeding values, we're relying a little, I'm relying on them a little bit more heavily as I move away from just pure, are the trees different? You know, when we're trying to think about calculating heritability and what that means, that's where their expertise is very, very valuable. It's been super helpful, but yeah, that's through usury. Oh, yes. So also, I, I agree with you, uh, you know, uh, it is very important, you know, have to do some cooperation with, uh, you know, uh, like a genetic scientist. Uh, so another is a question is about the genetic, genetic gain. I, I, I saw you uh, calculate the result of genetic gain. Uh, it's great. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, like the genetic gain uh, should be compared with the, uh, the parent, yeah, of, of the trees. Like, uh, comparison between the parent and the sons. So, but for remote sensing, I think we can only have one time data. So, so how can, can you do this comparison and calculate the genetic gain? So I, the way that I understand the trial setup is that those progeny trial that they're making the selections of, they're selecting their parents and those parents, the offspring of those parents are what's being planted in the realized gains trials. Um, Samuel, if you can nod, if you think that's correct. Yeah. So 
<laughs> I think that, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's the way that the system is. I don't know if we can do any, do it any differently. Um, it's kind of, we're trying to measure what the geneticists and what the field practitioners can measure and just do it faster and better, so. Okay, uh, also for me, I'm, I'm also learning <laughs> this yeah. kind of knowledge. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's kind of confusing how it goes up different levels and it's parents yeah. and children. Uh, yeah, I'm also learning. Yeah, thank I think you. if I'll just jump in, I think there is some um, some some crossing over between those trial sets as well. They'll they'll replant some some parents as as clones, and they'll they'll mix crosses from other populations as well. So it is complicated, and obviously we can't go back in time to age 22 and measure trees that were planted in the yes, 70s, in right? in China, but, I'm also, you know, uh, working hard to find a cooperator, yeah, like a genetic scientist, as a, also trying to learn, learn from them. So uh, we are we are all, all also working, yeah, okay, okay, working on that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> someone who has the information about the inventory, if that's usually through time, what is lost about the genetic. That's, that's great if you manage to have some brain value or at least to find a proxy for, for um, uh, gen uh, genetic value. Those are, are really important uh, through times. Uh, we'll uh, pass the mic to um, Samuel Grubinger, um, who is also from British Columbia, University of British Columbia, and we will talk about um, the use of new features that haven't been used so much in the um, historical research to um, develop new phenotypic tray, I believe. Um, Tanya will let you release your hand, uh, get more relaxed. And uh, Samuel, I will let you take the, the mic. All right, can, uh, can everyone hear me all right? And can everyone see this screen at a normal size? Uh, it's a bit small, I would say. We can see that your double screen, it seems. Uh, let's see. You I'm wondering if I can, because I am on the big screen here. Um, can I zoom in? Uh, no. Or share the. Uh, what if you change the size of your display? I think if you share, if you start the presentation and then you share the open presentation, it goes regular. What about uh, now? No, no, we, we haven't oh. seen. Try, try what Francois say to, uh, yeah, like that, and now stop. So if you, if you stop the screen share first before you do that, then it might help. Uh, try again. OK. Hold on. Is that better or the same? Uh, no, it's, it's the same. same. Well, we might have to continue. Can you can you yeah. see see what's on it? All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. sorry about that. Um, yes, as Francois said, I'm uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia as well in the same lab as Francois, the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio. And my talk will be a little bit different. Uh, as mentioned, I, I have worked on the Douglas for Realized Gains trials, but this is actually a different project um, around multispectral phenotyping and a different set of trials. These are interior spruce uh, provenance tests in British Columbia. And we're really going to focus on the spectral piece of it. So this is going to be more of just a walkthrough of the, the kinds of work that we're doing with multispectral data. So I, I'm not sure how much uh, remote sensing background everyone has, but I'll just do a bit of an overview of of spectral reflectance and the spectral signatures of vegetation. So this is kind of the classic vegetation curve. Um, you know, plants are typically green if they're photosynthetic, 
and we see this green peak in reflectance because chlorophyll absorbs red and blue light. Um, and chlorophyll is actually quite absorptive. It doesn't reflect a lot of light. But beyond the visible spectrum, uh, the light that we can't see, uh, green vegetation actually reflects very highly in the near infrared um, because of the structure of its cells. So this is kind of the curve of a healthy, uh, healthy vegetation. And a lot of indices, spectral indices, are based on exploiting the differences between these absorption features and reflectance features. And we often refer to that as greenness, but it also indicates uh, vegetation health. So the classic index is NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, that is really just a normalized ratio of the very high reflectance in the near infrared and the high absorption in the red part of the spectrum. Um, and as, as vegetation becomes stressed or plant function declines, we often see that those chlorophyll wells get flattened out and the near infrared plateau lowers. And specifically this red edge, that transition period, its, uh, its position and its shape changes. The problem is that for conifers, these indices often don't work that well, mostly by, because conifers just stay so green, right? They keep their needles throughout the winter, even when they're stressed, they tend to keep green foliage year after year. Um, so this red edge can be more useful than just the difference between these features. And there's a second class of uh, indices that we're really interested in here. Um, and that has to do with carotenoids and photoprotection. Um, so these are pigments that have a spectral signature that are used to protect the photosynthetic apparatus from excess light that it can't use under stressful conditions or during winter. Um, and some well-known indices are PRI and this CCI, the chlorophyll carotenoid index. And that's really picking up on this subtle shift within the visible spectrum from a blue-green to a yellow-green, really. So carotenoids and there are anthocyanins as well, but uh, these photoprotective pigments um, are indicative of big changes at the cellular level in plants. Um, and they result in a yellowing or a reddening of, of foliage. Um, and these indices can pick up on that. And you can see, here's a picture from our site, the same two trees in winter versus summer. And uh, they're not static. We kind of think of conifers as being green all the time, but uh, they change color and we can see that. So the tools that we're using uh, are kind of a relatively new technology. Um, and we refer to this as multispectral remote sensing, narrow band multispectral remote sensing. So these beautiful kind of continuous curves of spectral reflectance have historically been pretty difficult to produce. You need a spectral radiometer, they're expensive. You need very stable specific lighting conditions and you need to be out in the field sampling every tree or bring it back into the lab. It was either that or satellite imagery at a much coarser resolution and you can't decide when you go out, right? But now we have this kind of intermediate technology that's coming to the market that you can put on a drone, right? And it will produce um, many photograph-like images of narrow parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these, these bands are placed strategically, right? Specifically to produce the indices of interest that, that tell us something about underlying physiology or, or health. Um, and when you put these things up on a drone and fly around a trial of interest, you get images like this, right? They're kind of grainy looking photographs because they're only taking advantage of a, a small range of light. Um, and they look really different depending on where they are. You have blue where vegetation is very dark, it's absorbing almost all light, all the way out to the near infrared where vegetation is blindingly bright and woody debris is relatively dark. So because of this, um, you have to be very careful about lighting conditions. And this system that we use, the MicaSense, uh, comes with what's called a downwelling light sensor. So that's sensing irradiance, so the illumination that's being reflected back. And it is adjusting each image for the amount of, of light that it's theoretically receiving. Um, and you take pictures of these calibrated panels before and after flight. Um, and you can, you can get a relatively well calibrated spectral image that way. Um, but there are other considerations, lighting, shadowing, we'll go into that a bit later. 
The technology that we use to process this kind of imagery is called digital aerial photogrammetry. And it's it kind of looks like LIDAR and can be used in similar ways, um, but it's not an active remote sensing technology. So it works by iteratively detecting common features in pairs of images and then trigonometrically deducing the point in space of each point. And you end up with hundreds of millions of points and you can get very, very detailed three-dimensional structure. Um, so we actually use two slightly different technologies to extract spectral information. One is a high spatial resolution DAP product. So that's just uh, your standard kind of drone video quality camera. Um, and we can produce very, very high spatial resolution point clouds from that. And the other is this multispectral sensor rig that gives us really fine spectral information, but at a cost. You know, it's kind of grainy, it's kind of coarse, and the point clouds that it produces aren't actually really good enough to delineate trees. So we actually fuse these two data sets together. We use one for spectral information and the other for structural. I'll kind of walk through the process that we use to do that. Um, in these trials, which are, are planted grids with very small sample sizes, we really, we want to get every tree, right? It's, it's very important to delineate all trees correctly. Uh, so I start with a grid that's generated from census data with row and column information. And then that does have to be manually adjusted uh, to find each treetop. And from there, we use a watershed algorithm, pretty standard on a high resolution smoothed canopy height model, and we grow tree crowns. And you can see it does a pretty good job, especially when canopy closure hasn't occurred. But we also do some manual editing here as well, um, specifically the edges uh, and the boundaries between crowns are not often well delineated. Um, and these, I, I'm applying a 50% threshold here, the top 50% of each crown, but uh, it, can be, it can be done at any, at any height. From there, we can actually expect, extract spectral indices, spectral values. So this is the uh, chlorophyll carotenoid index that I talked about earlier. And uh, you can see these are those two data sets overlaying on top of each other. And we can compute average spectral reflectance values for each individual crown. We actually do one more step, um, which is a shadow mask, because it's very important to produce these indices on sunlit foliage. We don't actually want the shadows and we don't want foliage that has grown in the shadows. So again, we use the structural information from the high resolution point cloud um, and the sun angle information contained in the metadata of the photos. And we calculate where the shadows should be um, and we mask them out. Um, so the sites that I'm working with here are uh, provenance tests. So they're testing populations from across North America in this case. Um, this one is called Skamikin. It's in interior British Columbia, and it's part of a series of seven sites that I flew over the past two summers. And they kind of form a climate gradient from warm, wet Southwestern British Columbia to the interior of Northern Alberta. Um, and the, the aim of these trials, unlike the, the genetic gain uh, wood production aims is really climate change and and modeling the effects of climate on, on phenotypes. Um, so we have a really good data set here to test some of these new technologies because we have such a huge range in phenotypes. You can see it even at this resolution, how different the trees look from different parts of North America. And this is a hybrid population. So we have uh, Sitka, Engelman, and white spruce, and they all hybridize in BC. So we treat it as a single population. And when we look at some of these, uh, some of these spectral values across these populations, we see very strong, very strong clients. Um, so I'm not going to show you piece by piece here, and this is still in the process of analyzing all of it. But this is a, a transfer distance in Euclidean climate units. So this represents how distant the climate of each of these populations is from the test climate. Um, and this test climate, interior British Columbia, is pretty warm and dry for spruce habitat. Spruce don't really grow there very well. Um, and so you can see, apologies to the non-North Americans here for the abbreviations, but 
we have some northern Canadian populations, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and we have some southern US populations, Arizona, New Mexico, and they're all quite distant climatically. And you can see that their chlorophyll carotenoid index is much lower. Um, and we see this with other indices too, and other, uh, other uh, spectral, other uh, climate, climate units, pardon. Um, so we see strong relationships there. Kind of the next step where we're going at this site in particular is uh, looking at changes in these in these spectral metrics across time. I'll try to finish up here uh, for the sake of time. But uh, as I mentioned, they're not static. Um, and throughout the season, they change quite dramatically. And I think this is really the exciting application of this technology because we plant these trials and we have to wait decades for these slow changes in mortality and productivity to accumulate to a measurable degree. But actually, they're, they're the result of a suite of physiological processes that we can often see in remote sensing. So if we can measure the response to a period of drought stress or a period of cold stress, rather than waiting for those responses to build up, that might be a shortcut to figuring out you know, which populations are most resilient to climate change, which are good candidates for, for breeding, all of these questions that we're trying to answer. So uh, stay tuned on that. And um, for those of you not from BC, I just want to bring up kind of some of the challenges that we deal with with these trials. Uh, they're often in very remote sites. You know, I drove 15 hours to northern Alberta to get one of these sites, and they're often in basically unmaintained roads and locations. The visit intervals are often three, four years, right? So that's a challenge um, in terms of bringing remote sensing equipment out there. Weather too, we have a pronounced rainy season here in British Columbia. And recently, we also have a very narrow window during the summer that is smoke free, where we can actually collect high quality imagery. So that's something something we increasingly have to deal with. Um, and then validation, we're at the point where we really need large validation sets. I tried to collect some myself, but it's very labor intensive, right, to bring a spectral radiometer out there on a the ladder and, and try to get good quality data, especially if you don't know what you're doing. And then finally, the, the location sites where these were, were planted, they weren't thinking about drone flights when they put these sites in. And there are often very tall trees adjacent to the site, which really limit how low we can fly. Um, and the access lines of sight are often limiting as well. Um, so I think in the future, we'll probably keep that in mind more when we, when we put in new trials. But uh, it's certainly a challenge right now. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions, any discussion we might have. Samuel, excellent presentation. I remember some uh, Kiwi colleagues using Fireman ladder to be able to keep the drone inside while being above the, the canopy tree. Those are exciting missions, I suppose. Uh, ooh, we already have uh, two participants raising hand. Um, Dave, please. Hi, yeah, I was just um, turning on my video again and unmuting. Yeah, another great presentation, heaps of uh, really interesting detail in there. And um, we've collected a little bit of multispectral data here, but have yet to find the time to do much with it. Um, so really exciting work you're doing there. A um, couple of questions in my mind. We've had seen issues um, with, you know, the digital, the DAP approach where yeah, we had trouble getting spatial accuracy or stability in the coverage across trials. So GCPs will, will tie it down at key points, but then we found the um, canopy surfaces could kind of drift away in between the control points. So maybe you could comment on that. And the, the second question was just about your spectral values. It looked, you know, you've done an excellent job there of um, extracting those and correcting for shadows and the like. But I just wondered about crown size, if that's, you know, do the smaller crowns create any difficulties? Yeah, so um, in terms of, of spatial correction, it's definitely an issue. And we, some sites are better than others, right? But the, so there's a lot you can do at the acquisition phase, and we kind of are all working together to develop those workflows. 
but high overlap is really key. You know, I fly grid missions, so I fly at high overlap and then I fly over it again at high overlap. And that also, I think, helps correct for some, some spectral changes. I mean, the lighting conditions are going to change over the course of your flight. There's nothing you can do about it. It might be extreme, it might be mild, um, but having at least two time points per location, I think, helps. Well, if there is that image that can't be matched, the software doesn't know what to do with it, you can get around it that way. And then the newest thing that we've been doing is actually throwing a high res camera imagery and multispectral imagery into the software altogether and having it match points across those image sets. And remarkably, it seems to have no problem with that. Um, you know, the SIFT algorithm that's behind most of these um, photogrammetric software, it really has no problem with different resolutions and different values, which astounds me. But um, so what you end up with is are, are two photo sets that are geo-referenced as one, and then you can just export one of them and you don't even have to deal with GCPs or any of that. So yeah, that's that's an approach we've been taking. Um, but again, if you if you didn't do it right in the field, which has happened to us, there's not much you can do after the fact in some cases. And then uh, you asked about spectral values and crown size. Yes, yeah, so that's an issue. I mean, there's a lot of shading that happens, especially in these plots where you've got really maladapted populations next to really you know, elite selected populations. So they'll quite often just crowd each other out. And we want to choose a conservative shadow mask so as not to knock out too many trees. But then at the end of the day, if you've got a dinky little tree that's totally in shadow and not visible, there's not much you can do. Um, so yeah, that is an issue. And I think for spectral values, uh, if you can get it before canopy closure, that that's really ideal. Uh, but that's why we apply that threshold to to try to only take only take the top of the canopy. Yeah, and is the threshold is a, sorry. No, it's saying, the, the threshold is the same across your whole experiment, so you are in bias analysis at the end. Theoretically. <laughs> Theoretically, uh, Francois, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering how old are the trials and are they kind of, were they all planted at the same time in the same summer or? Yep, they were all planted at the same time. They were all either 15 or 16 years old when I flew them. Cool, and so the selection of those trees, is that specifically for reforestation purpose? Do you know what yeah, the, so the, for those trees are? The primary focus, so these aren't, they aren't pedigreed populations, they're just seed lots. So most of them are of unknown parentage, but the location is known. Um, but these trials are cool in that you have both selected populations and wild populations growing side by side in the same, in the same tests. So you have three classes of seed, B, A, and A+, plus, um, and then you have a huge range in the source of those seeds. But the primary uh, the primary goal is to establish the seed transfer functions that guide where you can plant what in British Columbia. That's that's Greg O'Neill who put these trials in. Um, and then a secondary a secondary approach is this question of well, do genetically improved populations help us or hurt us in a climate change scenario? And where is that threshold where you might might be shooting yourself in the foot with too much improvement um, because we haven't really tested genetically selected material in, in extreme climates. You know, the realized gains tests are, are usually in pretty, pretty standard environments. They're, we're not planting them way outside of the, the climate envelope of these trees. Regarding the longevity of your forest, you are talking about having the use of climate units. Which type of climate and weather feature have you been using to compare between Arizona and North um, British Columbia? Yeah, we're using Climate BC and Climate NA, which is Tong Li Wong's work. Um, that's what we've been using. You know, there is this question of which which normals do you use? Uh, you can calculate climate values within the, the lifetime of the trial, or you can calculate it further back. Um, I kind of looked towards what the government has done there, which is just using the, 
the normals, the 1960 to 1990 normals for from climate and climate PC. And the, the frost, for example, uh, must be way more important in, uh, in your region than it would be in the Arizona, for example. So what would be the impact of these particular features, snow, frost, um, or, or invertly, what is the big heats, large heat waves or impacts on your, on your leaves and um, in chlorophyllia? Yeah, so we, we actually flew the, the two summers where we did this longitudinal experiment. 20, let's see, 2020 was an extremely wet, cool summer on average. And then 2021 was massive heat and wildfires here. So those will be really interesting results to, to look at. We have another in the, oh no, it's Francois sharing the climate now. Cool, thank you, Francois. I still have one question. Uh, in one of your last slides, you were comparing uh, your GB photo um, between different time of the years. Um, the last photo, the, the tree looked really grayish. Or was he healthy at that time? And what, did you manage to do a full uh, rotation on those photos? Uh, sorry, what was the last color? thing you said? Oh, is that a normal color? Um, in March 31st, uh, or is it a healthy version of your tree there? And did you get a full um, uh, rotation of tree, like a yearly imagery? Is July 2, 2019 is comparable to July 2, 2020, for example? Yeah, so well, keep in mind that the RGB images are not calibrated. They're just okay. drone images, right? So the lighting condition probably will, will impact them more whereas this index is calibrated for reflectance. Um, so that's, that's truer in terms of spectral values. Um, but you certainly see, I mean, just looking at the imagery, you can certainly see a difference. They're, they're a much kind of dustier, more orange green than uh, during the summer where they're quite, quite bright and blue typically. Um, but you also have all sorts of uh, phenology effects in there as well, new foliage versus last year's foliage and uh, the lighting conditions train change drastically as well. So uh, there are a lot of challenges, but we're kind of trying to tease that apart uh, and look at index value changes over time. Um, but yes, we got two years. This is just one year of the two, two year series that we, we got for, for this site. And yes, it was comparable or uh, to be honest, really? I have not looked yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do we have more questions for Samuel? All right. Thank you again, Samuel. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter would be Dave Pont, David Pont from uh, Sion Rotorua, New Zealand. And he will talk about uh, an area based and tree based approaches for a New Zealand experience. Okay, thanks, Max. I'll just try to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, so how are we going? Can you see my screen and hear me okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. Great. Okay. So yeah, slight change of pace. Um, two really interesting presentations gone before me. Here I'll sort of talk at a broader level, but I will um, use some studies we've done to illustrate some of what we've been up to. But yeah, the idea here is just to give a a bit of a broad brushed overview of uh, what we've been up to here in New Zealand. So yeah, at the outset, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, this is obviously, you know, quite a collaborative effort. Um, there's organisations such as the Forest Growers uh, Research Organisation here in New Zealand. They collect the levy from the industry, so they represent the industry interests. Radio Out of Pine Breeding Company, represent our tree breeders. 
Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment is a major source of government funding. So yeah, typically those four partners, you know, Siren and those partners are involved in the research we do. And then at the bottom there, growing confidence in forestry's future and resilient forests are a couple of large research programs that have uh, run recently where phenotyping work has featured prominently. So yeah, background really to the New Zealand work in, in phenotyping really kicked off with this GCFF research program. So that was a multi-year, multi-million dollar program, quite ambitious and large in scope, uh, with a kind of very high level vision to uh, develop precision forestry in New Zealand. And really a key enabler, a core component of that research program was the idea of phenotyping the forest. So treating the forest as an experiment, using remote sensing and other data sources to characterize the forest and the environment, and then analyzing that to understand the behavior of different breeds across the landscape. So yeah, that program ran from 2013 to 2019. And projects that are occurred within that predominantly, um, yeah, my title, the original title, I, I modified it slightly, was area based and tree based. I've added here also the low canopy. So this is an area uh, we've moved into more recently. And I think Francois touched on that in his talk as well. So yeah, the, to illustrate the area based work, I'll talk about a project we did with a forest company here called Hancock Forest Management. And the tree-based work, we've worked quite closely with the uh, tree breeders, so RPBC uh, is the acronym for these people. And then for the below canopy, we've also worked closely uh, recently with RPBC and others in that front. So I'll touch on some research we've, we've done in those areas. So for the area-based work, um, the objective here was to work closely with a with forest managers um, with the goal of, you know, that they would like to manage productivity across uh, forest or state levels. And they're very interested in, in these methodologies. So, in fact, I believe I saw uh, Simon Patz um, signed in to this talk. So he was the representative of this company. We work closely with Simon and also with Heidi Dungy. She's also... Um, in from Siren. Yeah, we all work closely together on this and Maxime, in fact. Yeah, so um, it was a really interesting collaborative project. The approach we took um, 25 by 25 meter grid of productivity surface, which had been derived out of uh, airborne laser scanning. And then we compiled that together. So we compiled together that phenotypic data with information on genetics and management, which came from very good stand records the company held, and then put that also together with environmental data in the form of climate and soils layers in particular. We applied machine learning uh, methods. Maxime was actually um, the basis of our expertise here. We specifically used an um, approach called CatBoost, so decision tree approach, and yeah, train models to predict productivity across the estate. And so the machine learning approach, um, yeah, I guess there's a few phases. The first, as I've just said, was to compile all this data. It actually takes a fair effort to do that and do it well, uh, error check, and just, yeah, you need to start with the best possible data set. Uh, then there's the phase of uh, feature selection. So, Machine learning methods are amenable to, you know, large numbers of variables and so on, but you still need to think uh, carefully about what variables you, you present to it. And you need to work on uh, parameter tuning and uh, sort of fitting the training phase quite carefully. This is actually where most of the effort goes, is this upfront data preparation, really. Um, and then ultimately you build a, decision tree and you're able to rank um, features that were used in that decision tree. And so in that particular project, um, 
when uh, with a, a model which could estimate yield, uh, we had a couple of um, variables actually, site index, which is um, mean height at age 20 for Adiata Pine. And we had another index, uh, 300 index, which is uh, effectively a, a, an index of volume growth. And we found we could get an R squared of 0.92, really high. But more interestingly, well, you know, also interestingly is the ability to identify the, the key driver variables. Uh, so that chart on the right illustrates the uh, ranked features out of our decision tree for site index, I believe it was. And we color coded them here. So as well as the size of the bar showing relative importance, the colors show the type of variable. So genetics in yellow. Uh, the uh, environmental variables in green, and then management variables in blue. And so an interesting observation was that, you know, in the top five, we have, we have all three represented. So in other words, genetics and environment and management are all strong determinants on productivity. And one of the sort of aims, I guess, longer term aims was the idea that the forest managers might be able to use such models to select the best genetics for different sites within their forest. So moving out of the tree-based work, we've done quite a bit of work in this area, um, focused in on genetics trials. And yeah, we found them a really useful uh, test bed training ground, as well as it being an important area of application and I've pretty much worked exclusively on these progeny trials. So these are the, um, what they call single tree plots. So as Francois mentioned, in these uh, type of trials, it's imperative to accurately match individual trees uh, to the, to the uh, ground truth effectively and to you know, accurately match to tree IVs because it's all about that parentage. So yeah, the approach is Francois outlined, you detect trees. Uh, we produced crown metrics. Predominantly in my work, I've just focused on pretty simple crown size metrics derived out of the canopy height model. So the raster metrics. I haven't uh, pursued um, in as much detail as Francois looked. We're, um, for example, looking at alpha shapes and the like. And the idea was to take those data and look at trying to account for, as well as, you know, deriving the crown metrics, we wanted to quantify environmental effects that can occur within the trial and also to develop competition indices. So the image on the upper right illustrates our delineated tree crowns. Uh, the yellow dots are uh, block corner peg points. The image in the middle illustrates this idea of deriving competition indices. So taking a target tree, looking at its immediate neighbors, and then deriving indices that represent the level of competition that tree's experiencing. And in terms of outcomes, um, yeah, we, we were able to get a very high level of tree detection accuracy. Um, and as you've seen in that earlier work, um, also, you know, uh, high accuracy in estimating height. We found that the UAV based LIDAR was a preferred data source to the RGB imagery. And that was, um, you know, I touched on that in my question to Francois. There, there are issues with the um, spatial accuracy of the RGB. It's it's a very interesting data source, but yeah, I think we're still yet to nail down a, a bulletproof methodology there. And by accounting for environmental and competition effects in the trial, we found that there's potential to improve the estimates of heritability, which is quite interesting. Um, even though the trials are designed to minimize environmental effects, they can and do occur, as well as things like mortality and the like wind throw, which um, create opportunities for uneven competition levels in the trial. 
And so, yeah, that, that was a really useful outcome. Um, we're also interested in these competition indices for tree growth modeling. And we also saw some interesting um, hints that competition is playing a role in regard to disease and growth dynamics. So yeah, we, we didn't get so far in pursuing that, but I think that's an interesting lead. Just a little bit more work here on tree-based done in a much younger trial. So that prior work was at um, age eight, which is when they typically assess these um, progeny trials. But this work here was done at year two, so seedlings. This is basically, you know, quite soon after establishment. Quite different challenges here. The trees are really small. Uh, you need quite uh, high density LIDAR to be able to differentiate them from the ground and any um, other background kind of clutter, weeds and the like. But yeah, the, they were able to get really good results in estimating heights uh, on even on trees uh, of that relatively young age. And yeah, a really good R squared on height actually from UAV LIDAR. Some more work we did on tree-based um, analysis was to then extend it to sort of walk away from the genetics trials, which are a really interesting um, place to develop them. But we also were keen to start applying it and scale it up to uh, forest stands. So here we uh, took an operational forest stand of about 40 hectares. I've you know, we had the order of 10,000 trees probably. And we detected and characterized every tree in the stand. And then using the methods I spoke about earlier, um, we took the basic phenotypic observation of height illustrated on the top left, and then used modeling approaches to account for microsite effects and competition effects. Those are illustrated on the top right, bottom left there. And then by extracting those or accounting from them, are able to, well, we were attempting to extract a cleaner genetic signal. So that's image on the bottom right, the idea being uh, by extracting these um, environmental effects, effectively is what microsite and competition are, then we, in theory, getting a cleaner indication of the actual genetic component of the phenotypic observation. And so, uh, yeah, really interesting approach. I think still a bit of a prototype, but the results are really promising and we're very keen to keep developing that. There are applications for identifying um, superior or even inferior genotypes in the field, uh, as well as, you know, it could be a useful tool for detecting um, trees with superior genetics with regard to disease, for example. And yeah, the most recent work we've been doing is um, this below canopy. So Francois mentioned this and showed it quite nicely in his talk. When you scan from above, you get really good definition of the upper crown. A few points on the stem, but really not, not many. Um, and so, yeah, the image on the top right there, uh, the first one illustrates, you know, uh, scanning from above the canopy, you get all that nice high density in the upper canopy. Um, in the middle image there, if we scan from below with portable LIDAR, then you get really good definition of the stem and lower crown, but typically, particularly in closed canopy stands, you're missing the upper crown. And then, yeah, by actually fusing those two, I created the image on the upper right where you get a more or less complete description of the tree. And um, that's, that's really useful. And so, yeah, we, we have objectives really to better describe stem and branching because of their important impact on um, tree value effectively. And scanning from below certainly seems to be the only way to characterize that part of the stem. Um, it doesn't matter how much point density you pour on from above. The way I put it, um, well, certainly this is what we've seen to date. The way I put it is, you know, tree foliage is doing what it's designed to do, which is absorb light. So 
you can just keep bombarding, you know, with more and more passes, more and more pulses per second, but typically uh, the majority of that gets soaked up in the, in the canopy and it's really hard to penetrate through to the stem in closed canopy situations unless you, you know, go beneath the canopy and scan from below. And so, yeah, that work, um, yeah, we've found that that approach to scanning is um, quite effective. We've also developed methods to achieve high stem detection from data collected that way. We get um, nice high R squares and estimating BBH heights sometimes are trickier if you're not getting that um, penetration all the way to the top of the crown, but actually in some cases um, there's still enough information there to get a reasonable height. And there's ongoing work in trying to automate those processes and also it's quite interesting to use these data in a VR setting um, and there's work going on to cruise trees um, by working inside the point clouds collected in this way. And then a final word on tree-based work is we're also looking at the link to internal tree structure. So at Scion, we have a um, really interesting piece of technology they call DiscBot. Uh, you can cut discs from trees at one or more heights, put them through um, an automated um, robotic system that collects six different variables. So uh, they're illustrated in the center bottom image there. There's um, NIR, which effectively, they have models to predict the lactam, glucan, and lignin um, content, which are uh, important chemical constituents of wood. And then it also measures microfiber angle, uh, basic density, and spiral grain angle. And so this is a really interesting piece of technology to characterize the internal structure of trees. And as I put it, you know, phenotyping wood. And so that's really interesting and, and powerful in its own right, but it gets, uh, it's going to be very powerful when we really start linking that with these other data sources, such as, you know, looking at crown structure and the like. And so just to conclude um, about those three phases of work, yeah, the area-based and machine learning approach is a really useful tool for forest managers. So that ability to look across forests or estates um, and to really understand uh, the drivers of productivity across the forest. The tree-based work is proving very useful um, to you know, um, evaluate trials, not just genetics trials, but actually other forestry trials. It's a very um, powerful capability to be able to draw down to that individual tree level. And yeah, this work on particularly the competition effects um, has proven to be really useful and, and we're gonna continue to evolve that. And then yeah, this idea of getting below canopy to really characterize the tree stem and branching is an area we've sort of started in and we'll definitely dedicate um, a lot more effort to in the near future. And then, yeah, just looking ahead, I mean, forest managers are, are very keen on the idea of models or tools which could recommend which breeds they put on which sites and, and that's going to be really powerful capability for them. Yeah, the idea of tree breeders, like the idea of using this, these phenotyping methods to develop better breeds quicker, you know, that, that uh, fairly long turnaround in evaluating progeny and trials, yeah, any ways they can uh, speed that up, improve uh, reliability, throughput and so on is really useful. As I just mentioned, the work on uh, competition is is yeah, actually proving to be a really interesting area to help us really tease apart these genetics, environment and management effects on trees. And then yeah, the potential to apply those in new domains is just, just starting to happen. So really starting to work with the forest health and nutrition people 
for example. I'll just play, yeah, I've got a little bit of work here done by another colleague, Damien Salia. So as well as all of this remote sensing and modeling work, we also have a, a strand of work going on, which is, you know, to simulate tree growth at a, at a fine level. And so this animation uh, just shows the, the growth of a very, very simple architectural model of a tree, but it's a faithful representation of primary growth, so the apical leader extension, as well as the production of branch, first order branches. Uh, they're only represented as a short length, but yeah, the branching patterns are accurate. This on the right here is a very geometric person to give you an idea of scale, and the simulation just runs through time and shows branches emerging, or you know, at least the first shoot of um, first order branches emerging, and then the thickening of the stem. So in Damien's work, he actually models um, not only these primary growth processes, but the secondary growth, and it's actually done um, by modeling water and flow and transport processes. It's actually quite a sophisticated model. I mean, this literally, you know, is a stick model, uh, but actually there's quite complex things going on behind the scenes. And um, part of that is that it generates, as shown here, the complete internal structure of the, the tree. And so that image there is just showing the tree being kind of split in half, if you like, to reveal um, its internal structure. Okay, I've got to figure out how to make the next slide happen. Without, no, <laughs> excuse me, might have a... I don't know what's going to win there, am I? What's next screen in a general sense? Try that. Okay, got there. Right, so here's a closer look at that internal structure. Uh, so his model is able to not only uh, model the stem size and branching, but also the internal structure in terms of some key wood properties. So here I believe on the left is wood density. And I think on the right might be time of flight. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but probably stiffness. Yeah, those are two um, key wood properties of interest. And so the ability to model these things um, as part of our work and, and long term, we like to link this all up to the phenotyping work. So yeah, just to quickly acknowledge some of the um, collaborators on all of this, a large number of people um, in each of these areas. I won't go through all the names, but yeah, clearly this represents the work of a, a lot of people over several years here at SIA. And then just a final slide, pointing to the future, pretty much breaking news, uh, it's on. We just secured a funding for a, another uh, long-term research program. So with the uh, MDIE has funded a, another one of these joint programs involving industry, government and Scion. Uh, we have 10.5 million New Zealand dollars over five years. The idea is, um, yeah, and, and this, research program is squarely focused on phenotyping. So the prior one was, uh, it formed a full core component, but here the focus is squarely on phenotyping, which really underlines its importance. The idea is to take the ability to characterize individual trees and ramp it right up to regional scale um, and you know bring in the very latest state-of-the-art uh, methodologies to do that. The three key phenotypes being focused on are disease resistance, drought stress, and carbon. And yeah, particularly on the disease and drought aspects, there will, there's a strong component of um, hyperspectral slash multispectral. So yeah, that, um, that's very relevant in terms of some of the research Samuel was showing, but it's an area we definitely will be heading into. Um, to use spectral data to characterize uh, stress responses. And then a key outcome is, as I touched on earlier, this idea that 
we would like to be able to optimally match genotypes to, to sites and there's potential for um, quite significant productivity gains by doing that. So yeah, that's about enough from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, David, and congratulations for your research program and BIE. I know there's also a high competition index there um, to, to work to, to find that out. Um, we have eight minutes, so one or two questions. Do we have any participants? Yes, Francois. Oh, two questions. Francois, please. Um, so I just had a question about the software that you use for the tree delineation and whether or not that's proprietary or do you use something that's um, open source? And then also um, whether or not with the data fusion that you're doing where you're detecting the tree stems, if that's potentially something that you're gonna to move towards doing. So rather than trying to find a tree top, which may or may not be where you think it is, um, using the tree stem and then using that as the location of the tree. Yeah, yeah, good questions. The tree detection and the, um, so I use a, you know, classic stuff, a CHM. I apply um, a watershed algorithm and yeah, I did write a little bit of Python code just to refine the, uh, the crown boundary out of that, as you're well, well aware, the watershed will completely tile the image and so it'll float out into the gaps between trees. So I do um, just use some pretty simple techniques to pull that back to the actual crown boundary. In fact, I use both metrics. I, I use, um, I call it the gap and, and the crown, you know, and I'm full, fully canopy closed stands are identical. Um, but yeah, often there's little gaps everywhere and um, even in a relatively close stand. So yeah, they're, the, they're useful metrics. It's all um, pretty vanilla stuff, nothing nothing fancy. And I've actually used the same methods for years. I keep a sort of, you know, sometimes wonder, gee, you know, at some point this is gonna look really badly out of date, but actually it's been serving me well. And I kind of like the simplicity you know, it, may, it means it's pretty robust. I understand what it's doing. Um, doesn't do any anything unexpected, and yes, yeah, we're fine so far. So, but yeah, the, as you covered, you know, the lidar package and others like it. There's there's certainly in the last couple of years been a lot of um, really powerful stuff become available, and I'm all for you know um having repeatable um well-known methods so yeah at some point I'll, I'll find the time to actually probably make the transition and uh and and use those um open source stuff instead of you know maintaining my own bits and pieces yeah yeah i mean we found um, well and i both found for the plantation stuff the raster based methods end up working better than point based methods just because you're on a regular grid um, yep. The other question I wanted to ask was when you're doing the data fusion, it looked like you had a geo slam that you were walking through the forest and then also mounted on a UAV. So do you think that you could do that data fusion with different, so that, cause that data set, it's the same unit collecting LIDAR from above. And so I, I'm assuming that it's a little bit easier um, do you think there would be a difference if you used like aeroplane LIDAR and tried to fuse that with that GeoSlam data? Yeah, actually, I think I have done the latter. Um, yeah, potentially the SLAM, you're right. You, you can, um, theoretically at least, I don't know. Well, we might've done it once. You can leave the scanner running. You can fly, take it off the UAV and then walk around with it. And, and it's one continuous data set and it will just, you know, do the slam thing on all of it, which is pretty cool. Um, but typically we would collect them separately and I have definitely merged um, separate data sets. Um, sometimes I rely on control points. So it's that fairly manual, you know, you get in cloud compare and click on common points and align them at least full park. And then it'll, it can be clever about the fine tuning. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a pretty standard workflow. 
Um, and yeah, I haven't done a huge amount of that fusion. Early on, it looked really compelling, but I've found to date, the projects I've worked on either require that from above perspective or they require the from, from below, you know? So the focus is either, hey, can we get heights and map trees? Or the focus might be, can we detect trees and get their diameters and branching? So I've yet to have to actually um, achieve both together. Um, longer term, that's probably uh, an actual requirement, I guess. Yeah. Was there a, the second part of your first question? I might have missed that. Even now. Anyway. It's like, that was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you, uh, there, there will be an ongoing conversation between you two guys. You are working on really similar aspect of, of the remote sensing work, and that's amazing. Um, Sorry, I don't know your, your name. GPS, uh, yeah. please. Uh, my I... name is Jörg Peter Schnitzer. I'm from Helmholtz Center, Center in Munich. And I, I was impressed by all uh, the presentations. But in all the presentations, we, we showed examples from conifers. And I, I think uh, we, we are most, we are in, in my lab, we are working with oaks. And the, the, the canopy structure of the cedar trees is quite different. How do we estimate the, the efforts to transfer what you have shown here very nicely on, on, on conifers with the very straight stem and, 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 and canopy structure to deciduous trees? Because that's, I think it's much more challenging. And when we think about uh, climate change and, and, and the climate resilient forests, at least in Europe, we have to transfer conifer-based forests to more mixed forests or more deciduous forests. How do you think these efforts can look like in future? Yeah, well, I can certainly give my two cents with the other um, presenters and other people could probably contribute also. I, I think that's a really big challenge. Um, and I think methods are, it's probably almost impossible to imagine methods that would be so adaptable that they would go from one to the other, uh, maybe somewhere in the future. But I think in the near term, um, these are quite distinct areas. and. There will be overlap, there will be the ability to transfer, but yeah, hard to imagine an algorithm that could just switch seamlessly from a conifer to a deciduous tree and, and you know, give you perfect results. There's typically enough parameters in these um, workflows that, yeah, it's going to take some significant effort. Having said that, we have recently started down that track in New Zealand. So, we have been looking at applying um, laser scanning to our native forests. So we have, um, they're actually conifers, <laughs> botanically speaking, but they look a lot more like an oak tree. They just happen not to lose their leaves, which is possibly even worse because um, at least with the deciduous trees, you have the advantage of scanning and leaf off conditions. Um, these trees never have leaf off condition unless they're dead. Um, and, but they have the very complex branching structure, very, they're very tall. You have multi-storied forests, um, yeah. And it's, we're actually getting some interesting early results, but yeah, you pretty much have to take everything you know and kind of start with a bit of a clean slate and just bring your knowledge to the problem. But yeah, not an easy problem at all. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I would think something else too is that thing about that bottom up approach. Um, at least if you can build cylinders using some of that GeoSlam data, you can go from the bottom up and you can find those connected. Yeah. Uh, so you, like a pipe model, maybe is a, is a different way of thinking about it. And then rather than trying to, you know, you're going to have lots and lots of local maxima, but you've only got one trunk. So maybe that's a different way of thinking about the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question. Is it a uh, quick question? <laughs> You're on mute, it's in. Hi. Thank, thank you for your excellent presentation. And I have a question. Uh, I wonder in the part of 
data fusion, uh, the URS LIDA data and uh, fused with handheld hand LIDA point cloud. So I wonder if it's, is it necessary to fuse these two data sets? And I mean that if, if the fusion is not uh, very high accurate, the the analyze the analyze uh, in steam point cloud will be influenced. So I wonder what uh, method was used to data fusion and uh, what's the accuracy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I used a, a fairly manual approach, as I said, um, selecting common points and, and merging them in Cloud Compare. So it's a pretty good methodology. Um, I think it might even give an error metric. Now, I'm, I'm not that certain about that, but I can't say I looked hard at um, quantifying the error. In fact, the point clouds you get from the two different perspectives have, yeah, the point densities are very skewed, you know? So when you scan from above, there's an incredible amount of um, points in the upper canopy, if you've used a UAV, for example. Um, and those traditional measures of points or pulses per square meter um, at that point, become a bit meaningless. Um, you, know, you can have very high values from a UAV of thousands of points per square meter. Similarly, when you scan from below or even more, you can even have an order of magnitude more. But what's interesting is you almost have to plot those distributions on a log scale because they fall off so rapidly in either direction. And in fact, when you're fusing them, both of them have, have relatively low density in the region of overlap. And so, yeah, personally, I'm mildly uncertain about the, the accuracy of the merging. And I think, as, as I said earlier, um, in the end, we haven't found a critically important use for that kind of data. So, yeah, for now, um, I'm not too concerned about that. But I, I am also aware that, yeah, no scanning from either below or above probably isn't going to give complete coverage of trees in all cases. And so perhaps we will need to do this fusion. And in that case, um, the, the SLAM scanner uh, and the ability to just keep it running between scanning from above and below and letting the SLAM algorithms do the fusing is probably the approach I'd feel most comfortable about. Thank you, and thank you for your questions. Uh, we will continue with the last talk of this workshop, um, Lin Tony Cao for multi-scale forest phenotyping studies in China's subtropical forests. Oh, thank you, Max. And I will share my screen. So is that okay? Can everyone see my yes. slides? Yes, it's ah, perfect. Good. Go ahead, thank good. you. <clears throat> good. Okay, so good, uh, hello everyone. So uh, today is my pleasure to uh, join the workshop of our working group. Uh, the, So new your sound is off. I can't hear you anymore. I don't know if it's me or
Nay, we can't hear you anymore. Your internet connection is in the red. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, maybe try to turn off your camera, but uh, keep the sharing screen. That would help. Yeah, they say your network bandwidth is low. Uh, I will let Tony in uh, 10 minutes to um, fix his computer. Um, Yo, Peter, uh, are you still around? Yeah, I'm still yes. around. Uh, you were offering to make a short presentation about your laboratory. Uh, and Holtz Centrum München, if I'm correct. I, yeah, I have to, I have to, uh... Log in with another computer, but um, it can be quite informal if you prefer. Yeah, or yeah, I will. <laughs> it's because I'm like my I'm at home. Okay, um, I, it also takes a few minutes. I have to look for another uh, for my. Okay, lab. no pro no problem. It seems like Lean. Uh, are you back, Lean? What's what, some seconds? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Lin, is your mic working? I can't hear. Yeah. You. So, hi, Philip. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, Max, can you hear me? Or I can hear you, but the hmm. yeah, uh, we were thinking maybe you can try to share uh, your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Let me try. Your webcam okay. it's works a bit better. And uh, uh, your Peter, you can present uh, your group uh, no, after, no after uh, the questions. Thank you. Hmm. Let me try. So Max, can you see the slides? Yes, it's coming. okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I changed the view option if it changed to everybody, but if the presentation is a bit too zoom for you, uh, there's a view option button at the top with a zoom ratio. Um, but yeah, Tony, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, let me let me do it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's start. So today I will talk about some of our case studies in in southern China. So this is the outline. I will talk about some research background, uh, the method, applications, and the conclusion and the prospects. So China. So our country is a leading country for world forest industry. Uh, China is a country with the large growth of forest resource and the fast development of forest industry in the world. And at our country, the forest area is around 220 million hectares, account for around 23% of land area. Uh, we have the largest plantation uh, area in the world, but we're still facing some challenges such as world demand, ecological improvement and grid development. Uh, and our country also is the largest country in the production and trade of forest products in the world. Uh, but the contracting chain between wood supply and demand still exists. 
So this is our country's national lead. Uh, our president, Xi Jinping, announced uh, during the United Nations Assembly meeting, uh, he announced that we need to, our country need to achieve the goal of carbon emission peak before 2030 and a carbon neutrality before 2060. And in this year, he highlighted again, we need to increase the forest air, improve uh, the forest quality and enhance the increment of ecosystem carbon sink. So precision silviculture and the forest quality improvement is important. And we think that the key is the optimal regulation and arrangement of forest physiology and structure. So we need a modest skill precision forest phenotyping information to support it. However, the traditional ground survey is usually with high cost and low efficiency. The traditional uh, remote sensing technology uh, it's difficult to apply modest skill, high precision for its physiological and structural information. So, uh, we, so these years, uh, we write lit literatures and uh, hold special issues and uh, working hard to working in the forest to use advanced remote sensing technology to try our best to extract the modest skill for its information and develop different estimation approach. So let me show you some of our methods and applications. Uh, first, uh, where, where is the subtropic? Uh, the subtropic region uh, is, is between the 23.5 to 40 Northern and Southern hemisphere. Uh, so you can see it on, on the screen. And uh, and you may find that in this area, it is in southern China, there is a large area of forest. So subtropic forest is already account for around 10% of the area of the world forest. So today I will show some case studies uh, for, for the forest phenotyping studies uh, in the subtropical China. Uh, one is in Yushan forest in Jiangsu province. Uh, we do some mostly bamboo, Forest phenotyping research. Another is the in Pijou uh, with gingo plantations, and the eucalyptus and Chinese fir in southern China, and the popular down redwood and gingo uh, in, also in our province. So first, it's a is a bamboo, uh, uh, because bamboo uh, around fourteen percent of the world's bamboo forests are concentrated in China. And the Muslim bamboo account for around 30% of the bamboo in China. So in this research, uh, we extract the radical phenotypic trains and, the, and also do the standard phenotyping estimation of bamboo, Muslim bamboo using the airborne full wave on LIDAR data. So this is a, the group of people that are on the airplane and this is the sensor that we use so this sensor is an integrated sensor with LiDAR, full wave on LiDAR, and the hyperspectral and high resolution camera. So we use this sensor to fly to the, the whole study site of Yushan Forest Farm in 2013. So this is the result. Uh, we, we, can, we can see that after the pre-processing of the full wave on data, we can see the vertical structure phenotyping of the bamboo. During, uh, they are under different management strategies. And, uh, and we, call, we can also extract the vertical distribution of uh, uh, effective leaf air index. So also we can estimate uh, the plot level phenotype change of the biomass for, for the bamboo plots. So because bamboo grows very fast, their growth, growth, growth rate picking up to around 100 centimeters per day during the growing period. So, and bamboo can reach their height around two to four months. So they grow very fast and accumulate a large amount of carbon. So we did a research using John uh, to detect, detect many four times 
in the growing season for the bamboo. Uh, so you can see the vertical distribution of their leaf air index in different months. So bamboo grows very fast. So, and uh, we can find the change of uh, their structure phenotyping uh, of the Muslim bamboo. So this is the second study site I will introduce to you. It's in Pijo. So in this study site, our research object is a, is a gingo plantation. So we will do tree level and flow level phenotypic trace extraction for gingo plantations. And the instrument we use is a fixed wing and a multi router UAV with a camera and a hyper uh, multi spectral sensor and a LIDAR sensor. So this is our result. Yeah, we can see the very clearly uh, that we can see within the stand and within the plot and uh, even individual angle that we can extract uh, from the high density uh, UAV based LIDAR. So this is also a result. We test a different uh, segmentation approach for the planted forest. So, and uh, we compare their accuracy and uh, the find the optimal approach. The approach can help us to extract the tree crown information. And we, then we can use the tree crown information. We can calculate the kind of cover, uh, which is a very important uh, term. Even if we want to define what is forest, we need to use uh, the term kind of cover. And we also, do some research. Uh, we not only use the remote sensing data, but also use some field data. So we cut some bingo trees uh, to, to fit the allometric equations. And use the allometric equation and the remote sensing data, we coupled with the process based physiological model. Then we can use the future climate data. Like we use climate AP, yeah. So divided also by uh, the professor in the University of Columbia. And so we can predict in the future, how can the planted forest grows? And all, also we can model, uh, test the results uh, under different uh, weather conditions. The third study site is in Dongtai forest. In this study site, uh, there are Tanrua Red poplar and the Gingo plantations. So in 2014, uh, we use a fixed wing airplane. Also use, use the, the LiDAR integrated sensor with the LiDAR hyperspectral and the high resolution camera. And we fly to a whole study site. And the data was covered in three different attitudes. Uh, so so this, this data was used to a kind of sensitivity analysis of the LiDAR data. Uh, Except the, the airborne LIDAR data, we also uh, do the near field remote sensing campings since 2013. So it's already eight years. Almost each year, we do the remote sensing camping in the study site. So we, we try different types of U Jones and uh, we, with the different types of sensors. And also, we try some backpack LIDAR and some terrestrial LIDAR in this study site. So these are some photos. Uh, we worked with the UBC, with uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University, and with uh, the Japanese University, uh, and so and also Wuhan University. So we 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 work we do the campaign together and uh, make full use of the data set. So this is uh, the result of the backpack lidar and the UAV lidar. We we work with the Hong Kong Polytechnic University to correct the two data. And it is then it can provide us a quite relatively complete vertical structure of, of the plantations. And then we can use these informations. We can calculate the taper equations. Yeah, we can use different models to fit the curve and provide us the optimal taper equations. And we also try some cheaper way because terrestrial LIDAR is still quite expensive. So why we try to use a camera. So uh, 
we did some research uh, with uh, other European countries. So we, we have an ISPIS scientific initial, initiative project in 2013, and we work together. So what we do is in China, we, we do the camera-based, image-based, obtain the image-based point clouds. And while, then we extract the tree location and the DBH uh, from the image-based point clouds. So this is the result. Uh, we can see that the, because of the camera, use camera is much cheaper than terrestrial LIDAR, but it, it can also still provide us a quite good result of the DBH. So this is the result that because we, we do research each year in the forest farm, so we collect data, modern temple data for the same, same forest stand. Then we can do some exchange detection research. Uh, so this is the result. The, the upper figure shows that, you know, different height, different attitude of UAV, we can, we can extract a different quality of point clouds. The lower figure shows us the change of the poplar because poplar grows very fast. So even in two years, we can see the significant growth of the young, young, young poplar trees. And also we develop some algorithms to extract individual trees, like uh, the, the, the one we use a three-dimensional relative position-based algorithm to extract the planted trees. And also we developed a, a, a automatic co-registration of multi-temple airborne LiDAR data. This is very important because if we want, want to, if we want to use the LiDAR data in different times, we first need to co-register the data. Then we, we can extract the, the chain. So this is another research because we got a quite a successful result in the ground using the camera. So we also try to put the camera on, on the UAV to help us to acquire a quite cheap, inexpensive digital air photography point clouds. And we, we do this research in, in different years. So we, we test whether the digital air photography point clouds in different time can provide us the growth of the plantations. So the result is quite successful. We find that for the young and middle age poplar, we can detect the change by the modern temple DAP data. So except uh, besides LIDAR, we, are, we also try to explore the potential of the hyperspectral data. So this is a kind of research. We merge the LIDAR data and the hyperspectral data, and we want to know the vertical distribution of uh, biochemical trains in the plantations, uh, like the carnival. So, so the result is quite successful. Uh, we, we extract uh, tree level uh, biochemical trains of the poplar and the down redwood. So this is some result. Uh, and also we do, do experiment, not only in the field, but also in the lab. So we compare the result. So this is the result. Uh, we can see that, see the individual tree, three dimensional distribution of the biochemical chains. But also for the stand, we can see the spatial distribution of the, like coralifor. And also, also we can see the change of different ages of, of trees the change of the vertical distribution of particles. And also we test the, the, the result, whether it, it will be influenced by the canopy density or will be influenced by the shadow. Okay, this is uh, our, the final study side I will introduce to you. This is in very Southern side, side of, of, of China. So it's, a, it's a near the tropical air. Uh, we call it a Gaofeng Forest Farm. Uh, this, in this study site, we fly the different data. We, we use an airplane to fly the LiDAR data and the hyperspectral data, but we also use the drone to fly to the LiDAR data and the RGB data. So this is the result. This is a trans, transect of UAV strip. So you can see that because we use a regal sensor. So the, it has a, very strong capability of penetration. So we can see this is the eucalyptus uh, 
uh, profile. So, but it, the result is very good. We can see the fourth layer, the in, in different height, uh, a complete vertical distribution of the of the poplar. We can find it in the profile, and uh, also we can find a chain. Yeah, uh, use the uh, the lidar data in different times because eucalyptus grows very fast. So it's clearly for us to detect the see the change, the growth of eucalyptus, and also because in this year there is a very high frequency of the harvest. So we can also find the harvest in the study site. In the study site, we also developed another algorithm which is very suitable for the plantations. We call it a kind of a height difference and gradient direction correlated energy function based model help us to better extract the individual trees. And in the plot level, we're trying to use some algorithms which is nearly similar to the deep learning approach to help us improve the accuracies of plot level estimation of the phenotyping trains of the eucalyptus and the Chinese fir. So let's talk about eucalyptus in China. So it's original from uh, Australia. So, but it's now in China, we have a very large plantation of eucalyptus in Southern China. It's, it account for around 7% of Chinese. Each year. So it is a, one of the most important plantations in China. So the research of the eucalyptus genetics becomes very, very important. So what we have tried to do is uh, in two years ago, yeah, we, we, we tried to start to work I think I have some network issues. Uh, we'll wait a little bit. Uh, we'll just take this opportunity to um, share with you about tomorrow, where Professor Linkao will also present uh, a webinar uh, associated with uh, Dr. Keishu uh, about processing LIDAR for extracting first phenotypics. So I think it's really relevant uh, with what is presenting right now. So the time will be the same as this morning, uh, 6 a.m. UTC. Um, sorry, I put the East Canada on the table there, uh, but for the West Canada, it will be 10 p.m. Um, 7 a.m. for Central Europe. Um, yes, so hope to see you maybe tomorrow. Is Lynn back? His uh, morning presentations have been uh, recorded and will be shared through the uh, mailing lists. Um, I will share through the mailing lists um, of the register member with the last uh, general, general assembly of the forest phenotyping working group, which happened at the beginning of November. Uh, remember, I will share again my part. Um, if you are not a member so far and you want to register, simply send an email to this working group WJ Forest Phenotyping at fz ulishde We are part of the International Open Phenotyping Network um, funded by the Julish um, Institute Research Institute. So just send me an email through this email address again. 
and uh, I will register your name and you, therefore you will have access to all the information in real time, such as this morning workshop, tomorrow webinar, and the future workshop we will um, set up in place in the incoming year. Thank you, Francois. Um, I see Kaiju is here, Dr. Kaiju. Do you know if um, Professor Lin is around or? Try for this technical issues. I hope you really enjoyed this morning presentations. Um, that is our first workshop as a person of the working group. We are been working really fully this year on bringing a community together who share a willingness and experience in forest and trees phenot phenotyping. Um, we are glad to see things are starting to, to run um, in a smooth way. Um, so hopefully you enjoy this morning and uh, we'll be able to provide you with more workshop in the future and more information. So I thank you everybody um, who has been present this morning or evening, <laughs> depending on the time of the day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Maxime. Done a great job. Good to see you as always. Likewise, it's always a pleasure. Yes, thank you to the presenters, correct. Yeah. Thanks, Maxime. Thank you, Heidi. How are you?